Okay, so, um, well, uh, so the reason I put this together was because I was, I've been making a lot of progress in my own music, and I wanted to share some of the insights that I've had and some things that I've been applying in my music that have kind of made it more interesting, and I've gotten a lot of great feedback on it, so I thought maybe it would help somebody else. Uh, and so one question that you might have is, you know, why some people are drawn to some songs and not to others. Um, and so what I want to share with you today is some ways that you can make your music irresistible. And I say irresistible because um, there's certain qualities of certain music that, you know, it's you just want to keep playing it over and over and over. You guys ever have a song like that where you just, You've listened to it one time, and you're just like, man, I got to hear that again, and I got to hear it again and again, and just kind of get on that. Um, but it's just, it just kind of fits the vibe there, the, the mood you're in, and just kind of hits you right at that right moment. Um, so then, uh, so I'm going to talk more about that. All right, so who the hell am I, and why should you listen to anything I have to say, right? Uh, so I'm an instructor here at SAE Institute, and a lot of you guys already know me. Um, but I'm also a DJ. I've been DJing for 16, I think 16 odd years now, and then producing for over 10, and I've been an audio engineer for the last uh, few years, three, four years. Uh, so I've been involved in music since I was a kid, and I've done everything from concert band to marching band to drum and bugle corps to DJing um, and live stage performances and all kind of stuff. So I've been involved in music in a lot of ways for a lot of years. Um, all right, so then what makes a song irresistible? There's uh, three things. So there's three things that make a song irresistible. And these are the three things that I've noticed about other music and that I've been trying to kind of put into my own music. And the first thing is energy. Uh, the second thing is movement. And the third thing is emotion. And there's an, uh, I've heard this quite a bit where somebody was saying you can have two out of three and you're still doing pretty good. Uh, and the same is kind of true for this, because there's music out there that does pretty well and people like it, and it, uh, it has a lot of energy, and there's movement in the song. Uh, like, there's some electronic dance music that you can point to and say, oh, that, that has a lot of energy, there's a lot of movement in there, um, but might not necessarily hit you emotionally in a certain way. It just kind of gets you all hyped up, um, but it's just high energy, and that's kind of it, and you get done listening to it, and it's kind of like, okay, that's it. Um, but then the things that I've noticed is like this, the, you know, the disclosures, um, even like the Adele's and like all these people who've like had songs that reach mil hundreds of millions of people. Um, they, they kind of have every, every one of these in there, they have some energy, they have energy, they have movement and they have emotion. And there's lots of different ways to create energy, movement and emotion in your tracks. And so I'm going to go more in depth on that. All right. Um, so then energy, right? So what is energy in a song? Um, one, one thing for, for energy is, is the key of the song, right? So the key of the song that you choose, if you choose a major, typically they're happy, minor, they're sad, um, something you guys might already be familiar with. And then you have things like blues scales, um, jazz chords. You can have, add sevenths and ninths if you want to get. Uh, if you don't know too much about music theory, then um, some of that stuff might be kind of confusing to you, but you can always start with the majors and minors, uh, and those are relatively good place to start because a lot of music is either happy or it's sad. Um, and that's, that's kind of general emotions that people have, but you can get more specific with the emotions um, based on like the, the key that you choose and, and then even the, the chord progressions, right? So the chord progressions, the way I look at them is like, um, it takes you on a journey throughout a, a song, right? Uh, so the way you play a chord, like uh, what chords you play and how you play them. I have this controller set up. I'm going to jump over here real quick, turn on my piano, see if this is, is that it? No. Where is my piano? The right one. Oh, yeah, so I turned it off. All right, cool. So I just wanted to show you guys some examples of some stuff, too, so I'm not just talking about it the whole time. Uh, but key, right? So we can start with just a regular C major, right? 
And that's generally kind of a happy kind of sound, right? Uh, and that's just a C major. Then if you flip it to a minor, and you do like an A, that's generally kind of a more sad sound, right? So the, but the way you choose to progress those chords, so if we just did a C and a, progress through the chords in the scale of C, So that takes you, that in, in and of itself takes you on a journey. And you can, how you play those um, and the order you, you play those in can take you on different journeys. All right. And so, uh, but you can also use those to create energy in your song, right? Uh, if you want to create a more positive kind of energy, you go with something more happy, right? If you want to take it and create something a little less happy, then you can change that, that C major. A C minor really quickly and that just changes the mood of the song all right so um, being aware of those faster and slower tempos are also other ways to change the energy of the song but those uh, just changing the key just change changing the chord progressions and even just changing faster and slower is kind of just one way of making music more interesting um, and I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into like other ways that we can make it more interesting too. But these are just good places to start with your music if you're not already playing around with this stuff. So like uh, faster and slower tempos, you can obviously take a song and if you play it, you know, if you play it kind of fast as opposed to changes the energy of the song, right? Because as soon as you play it faster, then it automatically starts to kind of speed things up for you. But there's, um, there's also things that you can use in rhythmic patterns. And I use this a lot when I'm programming drums and stuff to um, make things sound faster than they really are. So you can have a track that is 96 BPM, but it feels like a dance track. You know, like there's... Uh, actually, a lot of there's there's songs out there that are in like the tropical house kind of vibe, or even like Moonbaton, and they're, you know, they're only 105 to 110 BPMs, but they, people still want to dance to them. But then you have other songs like the Adele songs or um, ballads and things that are in the same tempo, but they just have a different kind of energy. They're lower energy and they just feel slower. So the the way you use the rhythmic patterns inside of your song. Uh, for any given tempo, can make it faster and slower, can make it feel faster. So then you have loud versus quiet, right? So if you play versus... The, and that's a very easy way, like a five-year-old knows the difference between loud and quiet, right? So um, happy and sad or fast and slow. So making music that is just happy or sad, fast or slow, uh, loud or quiet, um, isn't going to make it as interesting to people. So then you, uh, you want to start to add some layers. But even if you didn't add any layers and you just made a happy song that was up tempo and was moderately loud, um, you can still keep it interesting with the other things that I mentioned. So we have movement and then we have emotion. All right. So then movement. Um, you guys, do you guys like to move it? <laughs> I like to move it. <laughs> um, so movement, if we just define what movement is, right? Movement is just something changing over time. So if all I played was a C, it gets really boring, right? Until I make a change. Right? And then now it's going somewhere. But there's, again, that's kind of like that fifth grade level of like, okay, happy, sad, um, loud, quiet, fast, slow. Um, so then you can start to add things like turnarounds. If you're not familiar with what turnarounds are, it's, uh, I think it's more of a jazz term, but it's, uh, it's kind of like drum fills where you take a musical phrase, um, let's see, and then you just add something on the end of it to give it a turnaround. So if you played.
And if you were just playing that the whole time. And if you just played that the whole time, it gets really boring. So then what you do is. So you put something at the end of it and it gives it a turnaround and brings it back to the home base, which is that one note. All right, drum fills. Uh, you can you can do like a drum. Think of like a drummer on a drum kit. He plays the drums. He has like a specific phrase he plays. Boom, cat, boom, cat. And then at the end of it, he might do like a little drum fill. You know, like something where he fills in the space at the end of it. And what it does, it it changes it up a little bit, and it starts to create movement within the track. All right. In electronic music, you have things like risers and shifters, right? So you have the all this kind of stuff where you create these huge builds up and then you get the drop and all that kind of stuff. So there's like, there's those ways of creating movement in your track too. And that's, um, that's starting to add another dimension, all right? So it's not just, you know, I'm going to add a little fill here. Um, it starts to add another layer to things to make it more interesting. Uh, and then you have things like phasers and flangers that start to add movement and it's a little bit more subtle. Um, and the ways that those work is where, if you, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with phasers and flangers yet, but um, when you put it on there, it creates a phasing issue and it has this washy kind of sound where <clears throat> it, uh, it starts to create a movement, but it's more subtle, you know, and you can do um, other things too, like automation, LFOs, and uh, I'll open up a synth and I'll show you kind of what that might look like uh, and sound like. But um, movement, as far as like uh, just trying to create movement within a track, I've been using Auto Filter a lot in Ableton, and that's like a great way to add some movement. And then um, LFOs, you can use those to kind of automate other parameters and make things move. And that starts to add a new texture and new, um, uh, a new layer to your track to make it more interesting. All right, and I'm going to show examples of this stuff too. Um, but for now, uh, I just wanted to give you a rundown on what it was and then show you, all right? So we have tension and release is kind of another thing uh, that we can use as movement inside of the track. And I'm going to get more into that in a minute. I don't want to talk about that just yet. Um, so then if energy is what gets people listening, right? So if you have a track, it's got a certain vibe, then you might want to listen to it. If you're not feeling so happy and so happy-go-lucky, then when a sad song comes on or something that's a little more melancholy, whatever, then you might be more apt to listen to that because that's kind of the mood you're in. Uh, and so that energy gets you listening. And then the movement is kind of what keeps people listening. Because if you catch somebody on a certain vibe, but it never really goes anywhere, it doesn't do anything, it's just kind of the same thing over and over. It's that, like that same eight-bar loop. People get tired of it and they kind of tune out after a while. And I'll go more into the reason why of that in a minute, but it's, it's really like, uh, I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with somebody and it's like, it's the same thing. You kind of keep, keep hearing the same thing and they just don't tell you anything new. So then you just kind of tune out and you just think about, hey, what am I going to do this weekend? Something like that, right? So then it's the same, it's the same with music because if you're not giving people new information um, or, or you're not keeping them in that vibe that they want to stay in or maybe taking them on a slight journey, then they get bored and want to not listen anymore. So then uh, the last thing is emotion. So what is emotion? Anybody want to venture a guess? Reaction? Reaction to something. So emotion is a reaction to something. The, um, and that's not, not too bad, but the, the definition of, re, of um, energy, or sorry, if, of emotion is energy in motion. So E, energy in motion, emotion. Um, and really, uh, you could also say it's energy in movement. So that's where those two pieces that we talked about earlier, energy and movement come together to create an emotion. All right. And we're able to create that with music. Now, when we look at emotion, emotion is this really intangible kind of thing, right? Um, some people are 
more articulate in how they can say how they feel. But really, when it comes down to it, trying to describe certain feelings in words, um, words don't always really capture that as well as sounds do sometimes. So it's hard to put in words, and sounds sometimes are the best form of expression. You know, somebody might yell, they might scream out loud, and <clears throat> that would be a form of expression because they just have no words to say how they're feeling and expressing it at that moment. So then this brings it back to tension and release because in music, you, when you create tension, um, people want to feel that release, right? They want, you give them that tension, but then you give them a release. And so <clears throat> uh, one example would be, uh, what's another thing I'm thinking of? So if we do, if we do just this C scale, right? Or actually it's one. And when you play a chord progression, you go start with one and then you move on. And then it kind of wants to go back to the original chord, right? And if it doesn't go there, then it feels like you're missing something, right? So you can create tension. And that sounds kind of off, right? Until you get to there where it kind of resolves and feels good, right? So you can create this tension by playing notes really close together. And then resolving it. So then when you create tension in your music, one way to do that is, um, well, if you just look at a pop chord progression, right? The, was it one, uh, one, six, four, five? I think it is. Yeah. One. If you just play one, six, and four, five, so those are the keys in the scale, then that's just a regular pop progression. And what somebody recognized was that that pop chord progression, um, that it creates a certain bit of tension, but it's also like, it's very neat and tidy. You play these four chords, you play it in this order, and it just sits well with people um, because it takes them on this journey that they're used to. Um, sorry, so I'm getting off track. I'll get, I'm going to get into that in a minute. But... Um, Emotion is also like tone of voice, right? So your tone of voice and your intent behind something. And <clears throat> if somebody tells you, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. If somebody tells you something like, you know, you suck, it doesn't sound very believable if they use a tone of voice like, ah, oh, you suck. Or you can say somebody, you don't like somebody, but you can do it in a joking manner, right? They're like, oh, I hate you, or I hate you right now. And if you say in a joking tone, then it comes across as like, oh, he's just kidding. But if you come across like, yo, I hate you, like really angry, the tone changes. So then the meaning and the intent behind that changes. And the same can be inside of your music uh, when you're creating the sounds that are going into your music. Um, so paying attention... You might not use your own voice, but the artists you use or um, the sounds that you choose become the, the tone of voice that you talk in. So if you're using these like really glitched out, um, crazy synthesized kind of warped sounds that some people use in like dubstep um, <clears throat> and like, even some trap songs and like some of this some electronic music, it, um, it can come across as very aggressive kind of sounding. But then you have the things like if we go back to Tropical House and those kind of sounds, or even like the Adele's where it's just a piano and a voice. It's very soft. It's sometimes very warm. Um, it's the tone of, of the voice and the tone of the delivery, right? So the sounds you choose that go into your song can make a big difference. You can play the same exact thing. Uh, so what would be a good example? Like cover songs, right? So if you have um, a pop song, that gets covered by like a screamo band, totally different vibe, right? You have this really pretty pop sound. And I can't think of, I'm, there's a, 
a band recently I saw that, that did that. But um, they, they cover pop songs. Or actually, like, um, you guys ever heard of uh, Richard Cheese? Yeah. So he, like, he does these piano uh, ballad, like, what are they, um, jazzy kind of things. Yeah, like lounge music. He'll do, like, lounge covers. And he did, like, Nine Inch Nails. He did Johnny Cash. Um, oh, then there's Metalachi, this, like, mariachi band that covers metal songs. So they call themselves Metalachi. Um, and the tone, it's funny because if you listen to the original and then you listen to their version, it's the same exact thing, but it, it gives you a completely different feel. And so you can apply that to your music when you're creating your stuff because just by simply choosing a different sound, you start to change the, um, the song, right? The, the intent behind the song and the feeling of the song. All right, so then um, I had this picture in here of uh, this seal. Uh, just to show you, because you can have the, the seal right here, he looks like he's having a great time. And this picture of Nicki Minaj, it, it looks very staged. And as people, we can, we're very aware of those things. And especially our ears, our ears are very attuned to um, subtle nuances like that. Um, we can clearly see like one looks pretty real and the other one looks rather staged. but um, the same goes for your music too, right? So that's something to take in mind whenever you're trying to create your stuff is you can, it can come off as like not genuine, I guess, in a way. Um, but the funny thing is, oh, well, I'll get into it. But the, I had this saying when I was in the army or not me personally, but the saying I picked up in the army is false motivation is better than no motivation. Because when you're six in the morning and it's like, you know, almost zero degrees and you have to go on a five mile run, people are like, you know, false motivation is better than none. So we would just get into it and go run. Um, <clears throat> but it's funny because um, emotion actually can be manufactured now if you think about it. So if you're a music producer and you're creating sounds and you're creating mu music, you're now manufacturing the sounds that are going to move somebody in some form or fashion and create some sort of emotion. Um, and that's not to say that um, you should be like just trying to manufacture, you know, some sound. Uh, and it's not to make it seem like, um, like this McDonald's or fast food kind of let's package it up and put it out kind of thing. Um, but it's just to make you aware that as you're creating sounds, you're creating emotions, right? And so what emotions and what, uh, what, like, what emotions are you trying to create? You know, what, what sounds are you trying to create? What are you trying to convey with your music? So those are all things that, that I've been thinking about and been using in my own music. Um, so then I want to talk about catchiness because we're talking about how to make your songs irresistible, right? So if you have those three things, if you have energy, you have movement, and you have emotion, you've got a pretty good track. Um, <clears throat> but there are some songs that are manufactured in a way um, that are just come off as popular sounding or not even really popular sound, but they're just catchy. And they, you have these songs that people refer to as earworms. And so what, what constitutes this earworm, though? What makes it an earworm? And there's this thing called this phonological loop that I found out about. And really what this phonological loop is, it's short-term memory that focuses on acoustic information. And what it is is when somebody talks to you, right, and they uh, say you're taking somebody's phone number and they are giving you their phone number and you don't have a pen and paper to write with yet. So then what do you do? Like they tell you the number and you do what? You probably repeat it in your head, right? You're just kind of like, okay, it's this number, this number, and then until you find a pen and paper and you write it down. Um, that's your short-term audible memory and <clears throat> certain sounds uh, certain songs can get caught up in there and stay for longer because there are sounds and it's actually easier for us to remember sounds than it is for us to remember words um, and there's other research that's been done and kind of points to this whole thing of um, when we're born before we're born um, we have we're exposed to sound in our mother's womb and all this, um, without getting super scientific and everything, but um, 
So we're exposed to sound before we really understand words. And as kids, we make sounds before we make words, before we form words. Um, and so a lot of times it's easier for us to remember a sound than it is to remember words. Because like, ever try to tell somebody a song that you're like, oh, I can't remember the name of that song, but it goes like this. Ba, 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 you know, and you sing the melody of the song before you actually sing the words, unless you just know the words that well. Um, so that catchiness and that, that bounces around in people's heads is usually what's called a top line melody, right? And top line melody can also be used in bass lines too. You can start to use bass lines to make melodies. And in dance music, that gets used pretty heavily too. Um, instead of like a main melody, there might be just a bass line. And that's like what's moving people, you know? Um, <clears throat> but the thing about catchiness is that repetitive and rhythmic sounds, repetitive and rhythmic sounds win in this world, right? If, uh, and I'm not necessarily just talking about how to make catch, uh, catchy or pop music or anything, but um, if you want to make music that is like something that people want to keep revisiting and they don't want to turn off your song kind of thing, then um, people remember things that are repetitive and rhythmic a lot easier. We're just drawn to it as human beings um, for a lot of different reasons, particularly just how our brains are wired. And there's scientific research on that too, which I can't quote. I'm just not like that well versed in it, but I know that it exists and that people have, um, have already explored those realms and they're still kind of exploring those things. Uh, so we talked about sounds before words, um, but phrasing and simplicity, those are um, two things that if you want to make music that people want to keep playing and keep listening to is this idea of phrasing and simplicity. Uh, you can make really complex sounding stuff, but it's still, uh, you still want it to come across to, the, across to the listener as something that's like, they can walk away and hum it. And then that means they, that they, they understood what you were putting out in a way. So they, I, I've heard music where it's like, it's really cool music, but there's nothing for me to grab onto. And so it's just kind of like, giving me an experience at the moment, but it's like, um, I don't want to say, it'd be like a Hendrix solo, right? You can listen to that guitar solo and you're just in the moment, but I could never hum that back to anybody, you know? Um, so it's not catchy, but it takes me to a place when I'm listening to it, which is great. It's got energy, it's got movement, it's got emotion, it's got all that stuff that you need for a great song. And I think that's why people are drawn to it. Um, but yeah, there's also this idea of, you know, phrasing and simplicity. If you want to make music that kind of keep, people want to keep listening to and keep revisiting, um, our brains are just wired for, um, this familiarity. Uh, and I'll talk about this now. Um, so like chain smokers versus Mary had a little lamb. This, uh, this guy, Andrew Wong, uh, who's got this YouTube video. Uh, is it on here? Let me see. So I was showing you guys, or I was playing this a little bit earlier, but um, this guy, Andrew Huang, made this video, and I thought this was really cool. And he um, found a comparison between Chainsmokers and Mary Had a Little Lamb. And it's interesting when you start to think about it because pop music in general is, is kind of simple in nature, but this, this idea of familiarity, right? They, uh, there's another one, there's another article where they reference, um, they talk about that Call Me Maybe song. And the, one of the guys says that it's very similar to like Mother Goose kind of rhyme scheme. Uh, it's very simple. And so like some pop music and, and some music in general, like even dance music, like uh, house music, um, techno in some ways. I'm not, yeah, like dance music in general. Like let's just say... I know that's it's a very broad term to use for um, dance music. There's all those subgenres and stuff, but I'm just saying dance music in general, it's, it's um, fairly simple. It's very phrased out, uh, and if you listen to it, it's got a very repetitive kind of nature. You know, you've got that four to the floor kick. Um, you've got some hi-hats or something. You've got these sounds, maybe the bass line, that's very repetitive and 
<clears throat> might change up every once in a while. But for the most part, um, if you're into that music, it's very familiar to you. Whereas I think sometimes with these songs that really blow up and make it big, like Chainsmokers Closer or Call Me Maybe, they have um, kind of a farther reaching familiarity where they kind of reach back into your childhood. It's something that you were exposed to, but maybe you just didn't realize it until now that like, oh, there's that thing that I heard as a kid and now it's, I'm hearing it again. And so it sounds so familiar. Um, but if you want to um, check out that Chainsmokers Mary Had a Little Lamb video, I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, I'm just not playing a lot of stuff uh, for examples just so I don't get hit with copyright infringements when I post the video up. <laughs> um, but that's a really good video to check out. The other thing was um, this Radio Sandwich and Hey Ya. I put this in here because there's a, a book that I read. It's called The Power of Habit. And it's funny to find um, this in a book like that because the power of habit is talking about people and how our habits drive our life and our decisions. Um, but Hey Ya it started off as not a very popular song. It's, um, they have this software, uh, the heck was the company's name? Um, Albatron or something, something Tron. And this, this software, this, this company, and they review data from radio stations and they're constantly reviewing it and mining for more data and they know people's listening habits. And so they could like, they figured out that they could put in, um, they could play a song through it and then figure out what its relative, what its score was. And then it would tell you like, oh, this is going to be a hit or maybe not quite there. And there's this, this software that they have that they can do that. And apparently Hey Ya was like, off the charts. It was like, oh, this is going to be a, a smash. And so, like, the, the guy who originally was trying to push Hey Ya in the first place, um, <clears throat> he didn't even need that software. He just knew it was going to be a hit, but I guess they did that just to check. And, uh, and so they put Hey Ya on the radio, and it was an absolute flop. Nobody wanted to listen to it. And part of it was because it was an unfamiliar sound. It was very catchy, but it didn't sound like anything else that was on the radio. And so um, people will listen and they want familiarity with their music. It's, it's really interesting how, how that is. Um, as they even did research and they were saying that um, in that same book, the, the Power of Habit, they talk about how um, they did all this research on people and they, they surveyed guys and they were like, guys were like, oh, uh, I think Celine Dion was the one. And they were like, oh, I hate Celine Dion. Never want to listen to that, whatever, whatever. <clears throat> but what they found out was as they, they would play a Celine Dion song towards the end of the hour when most people start to tune out and people would stick around. It actually would increase their listenership by like 3%, which is apparently a huge number. And, um, and they, were, they were looking specifically at men. And so men were sticking around when these Celine Dion songs came off and came on and they would continue to listen through. And so they had these songs that they, that they called sticky songs. And so it's these songs that, I mean, there's obvious like songs that people are going to listen to, like the hit songs that like, you know, um, like um, Humble Now by, uh, by Kendrick, right? That song comes on, people are going to listen to it. It's just, you know, it's going to be something, people are going to stick around to listen to that. Um, but then there's other songs that they, um, they don't, they're not as popular, they're not as catchy or whatever, they're just not that. But what they are is they, they sound exactly like what you would expect to hear if you were listening for that type of music. And so those songs get played a lot. And what they were doing with Hey Ya was they would sandwich Hey Ya in between these sticky songs. And they would put that on the radio and play it and, and kind of custom people to hearing that with all this other music. And as they did that, it started to catch on and got more popular and people got familiar with it. So there's like, there's this familiarity that we have with some songs just because, you know, maybe it's like a nursery rhyme or something very familiar from our own, um, our own history, our own life, right? Um, but then there's this familiar through repetition. And so like, um, Hey Ya was, it's a very catchy song, has a catchy nature about it, but 
um, it wasn't familiar. And so like they had to kind of familiarize people with it. So why does this matter to you? What does this matter to your music? When you're making music, right? Making music, if you make your music and it sounds familiar to what people are already used to listening to, you're having, you're already starting off in a better position because you're already playing something for people that they're looking to listen to because they already listen to it. Um, and that's not to say that it's okay to just make stuff that sounds like everything else um, because you want to put your own fingerprint on it. You want to make it sound like you. You want it to be unique, right? Um, and that's not to say that just because you do it and it sounds similar to this other stuff, it doesn't sound unique. So don't think that just because you're making something and it sounds like, if you're making house music, right? Um, don't think that, oh, well, I'm just another house music producer. No, you're a house music producer and you make house music that nobody else makes because you make it the way you make it and nobody else can make it the way you make it. You know what I mean? So it's, it's looking at it in a little bit of a different uh, light. At least that's the way um, I've been kind of looking at things. So then these are some of the resources uh, that I talked about a little bit. And uh, we've got some extra time. So I want to show you guys some examples and stuff like that. Um, in a track that I released recently with my friend Lauren, and, oh, <laughs> so this is something else that I was going to talk about. Um, so this is a talk that I want to do um, the next time I do this. And so actually I was going to ask who in, would be interested in me doing a talk about finishing songs. Yeah, okay. Because um, I know that's kind of a big deal and people have, people struggle with finishing songs. And I don't know, like, in the last year or so, I've just gotten a lot better, or maybe even like the last six months or so, I've just gotten really good at just finishing songs. I'm just like knocking them out. Um, but yeah, there's, that's, you know, there's, that's a whole nother talk and that's why I put that separate. But I put this in here just to remind myself to mention it to you guys. Um, <laughs> Cause I've been here before too, where like I, I'm like, it's almost done. It's almost done, you know? So uh, I put this in here just as a reminder for that. If you want, uh, you can also check me out if you YouTube JR Noble. You can find my YouTube channel and I'll have other videos up there. Um, a lot of them are Ableton related. But yeah, I'm going to take this screencast video and post it up there because I was going to do this as a live stream, but um, didn't quite work out today. I got to figure out what the audio issue was there. And so I have the YouTube channel. I'll post this up there. You guys can check it out. Um, and then let me get out of that and get into this session. So this is the track that I was talking about. And I'm going to show you some of the different things um, that uh, in action, right? Some of the some of the stuff that I was talking about earlier between energy, emotion, movement, and all those sort of things. Um, so I'll play this song for you just so you can hear it one time through, and then I'll break it down. Um, so let me mute this track and I'm going to mute myself so that way you guys can just listen to the song. Stop into the apartment where a lot of our time was spent. Take down all the phones. Thinking how the sun is so unfair
Packing up all the things I left Fill the room up with emptiness Leave behind a mess of memories Say goodbye as I turn the keys As my heart comes to a stop With this track, uh, what I did was, uh, I started off, all I had was her vocals, right? And they actually were not the best sounding vocals, to be honest. She recorded them in her apartment on a snowball microphone. So we had to like, I had to go through and fix some of the issues with that. But then once I got that all worked out, um, I chopped up her vocals. And something that you might hear a lot in music these days, is um, chopped up vocals and pitched, kind of like all this kind of crazy stuff, right? So what I started with was her, um, her vocals, right? And this was the very first thing that I worked on. So let me uh, play this, just the, the vocal sample. <laughs> And the thing about that is if we go back to what I was talking about, um, movement in a song, right? And this idea of choosing, uh, choosing the key and all that and using melody, right? So I chopped up her vocals and created a melody line that you can almost sing along with if you were listening to, to this song. And it starts off with that. So it immediately grabs somebody's attention. So then, um, that's one way that you can start to um, get, people's, get people interested in your music is starting off with something that kind of immediately grabs their attention. So that was just one way that I, that I did it. Uh, and then you'll see in this song, the arrangement of it, there's, uh, there's this intro, verse one, then there's this hook with a breakdown, small breakdown, and then verse two, and then another small breakdown right before we build it up into another hook and then the outro. All right. And so the, the, uh, the arrangement of this song just kind of came about. It wasn't like I had pre-planned and figured out. This isn't like an arrangement that I use a whole lot. Uh, it just kind of worked out that way where I wanted to take people on a journey where it's like, it starts off kind of quiet, kind of soft, right? And then it builds up through the verse into this hook where it gets really big and then it breaks down again uh, right, goes, right before it goes into the verse. And then, in, uh, then it does this other breakdown right here before it builds up again. 
And out of the verse, so if you notice in verse 1, in verse 1, it goes straight to the hook, and then this breakdown. In verse 2, uh, instead of delivering on that hook right away, which most people would expect, I kind of took it a different route, and we break it down and build it back up again, which is something that happens a lot in electronic music um, where you'll have these, these breakdowns and these builds and all this kind of big epic stuff. So um, I used that in this arrangement because it's a very electronic sounding song. So then um, it's not completely unexpected, I guess in a way. So then using energy, right? So if you think about energy in the sense of like quiet, loud, right? So it starts off kind of soft. And it's just a piano and her vocal chops. And then it builds into her verse. And, and then after that, it gets even bigger in the hook. So if we just started with that in people's face and we're like at 10, you kind of don't have anywhere else to go from there. So think about that when you're uh, making your music as well, is if you're starting off on 10, then it's at some point you're going to have to like take it down a notch to bring them back up because um, it's kind of hard to keep it on 10 the whole time for, for a lot of people. Um, so it's just something to consider. You can totally do it and just have it on 10 the whole time. There's songs out there like that. Uh, but I'm just saying, if that's what you're going for, then just make sure that you're aware of that's what we're going for. Um, and then you can still use some of these other elements to still kind of keep it interesting throughout the track and add movement in different ways. So like, uh, so then there's these shifter kind of sounds that I use to get in and out of certain parts. So this breakdown, I use like a shifter kind of sound out of it. So if I play it from a little bit at the end of the hook. So it's kind of like a typical kind of shifter sound, right? Um, and you can even start to get more interesting. Like this is, I made, I, I think I made this like a year ago. Maybe we started it over a year ago. And then we, over that time, we made changes and everything. And then um, mixed it and mastered it and all that kind of stuff. So we've been kind of sitting on it for a little bit. But... Um, there's other ways to make this stuff even more interesting than what I did. And sometimes you can go a bit overboard. But um, if I open up this shifters part, and I'll just fill out my vocals so you can still hear me. And then I'll just play just that shifter sound, right? So this is... Really, it's just like a few sounds, like a crash cymbal and some other things kind of like put in there. But uh, where I started to have some fun with this was playing around with her vocals. Um, and so you can see I have like some shifters leading into this breakdown. So this, this part, it starts to build you up and lead you into where you think it's going to start taking off and get really loud again. Uh, oops, let me solo that again. And I mean, you can look, it's just the same exact thing here, but it's reversed. So I just took the same thing that shifted it down, brought the, the energy down for the verse, and then we start to bring it up for this, for this hook. But um, instead of taking them into the hook, I kind of drop the floor out on you. And it just changes the energy right there. So then if we listen from this part. Because in the part before that, if you listen to the first verse to the hook. Right, so it builds up and then it takes you there, kind of delivers on that release, you know, that what people are looking for in the drop. 
they're looking for that release. They're like, you're build, 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 and you're kind of creating this tension. And they're like, yes, I'm waiting for it. And then you deliver on it, right? And so one thing you can do is, and I've noticed this a lot in music, and what they'll do is they'll delay the gratification. The, they'll delay it. So it's like right as it leads up, instead of hitting you on the one, they hit you on the two. They hit you on that next beat. Uh, it gets used a lot in trap music, uh, at least from what I've heard. So like that's another way that you can start to keep people engaged and kind of keep them off off balance a little bit. It, it's not changing things so much that they don't want to turn it off. Um, it's just changing it a bit and kind of keeps them engaged a little bit longer. So then uh, there was another part that I wanted to point out. So we talked about um, getting people listening from the gate, right? Starting them off and getting them interested to begin with, um, and then taking them on a journey through your song, right? And keeping it interesting. One thing, if you notice, these are in, I think, eight or 16 bar sections. They're not very long sections before we kind of change it up again and give them something new. But even as we're going through this space, like if you look at this intro to verse one, this piano print here and this Lauren's vocals, they only last for half of this whole section. So we're not even playing this the entire time. So we switch it up like, Right over here. So it kind of goes right into the verse there. So actually, this verse marker should probably be more back here. But then the other thing is now we have about eight bars here that it's doing one thing. And then we add in some new stuff over here on this next section. But then we even add in more stuff about halfway through that. So we're continually kind of giving something new to the listener, all right? So as this song is building from the intro all the way through to the hook, you're giving the listener something new, all right? So you're, you're keeping them engaged. And it's what I was talking about earlier with, um, like, uh, what was it? Familiarity and let me go back to my notes. We talked about um, familiarity, uh, movement for one. So keeping things moving by adding some things and adding some changes. And then um, what was the other thing? Not catchiness. So familiarity. Um, that'd be more of the, the build and the, ten the tension through that, that breakdown section. So this whole build would be something that people might be familiar with if they're into something like uh, electronic music. Um, yeah, so then adding, adding layers in as you go, instead of just giving to them all right away, that's one way that you can kind of keep people engaged and listening. Um, oh, this is actually, I don't think I'd mentioned this. I was going to talk about this, but our brains look for patterns and things, right? There's a part of our brain that Legitimately, it looks for patterns and things. And once it figures out the pattern, it's like, okay, I got it. And it kind of tunes out again. Um, but then if it hasn't figured out the pattern, then it has to stay engaged. So if you kind of keep giving something new to the listener, then they have to keep listening to figure out what the pattern is. But you don't want to make it so confusing that they just tune out because, oh, this is too much. And that's where the phrasing comes in. Um, by making these short loop phrases, you're able to kind of give them something that they're like, oh, okay, this is now familiar. I get the pattern. And then when you add something like a drum fill or a turnaround on the end, it changes it for a second. So it gives them new information. And then they're like, oh, wait, this is new. And then you're bringing it right back to what they uh, were familiar with in the first place by giving them that rhythm back or that melody line again. So um, for this, for the intro, where I used her vocal chop, right, we, I take that away from you all the way through this first verse and through this hook until we get back to the breakdown. And then I bring it back and I give it to you again. And you're like, oh, I forgot about this. 
And there's a couple of other sounds in there to make it more interesting. So there's this little like bell kind of sounds and then there's clap. So um, I'm giving it back to you, but now I'm bringing it back in kind of a new fashion. So it's like, oh, I'm, it's familiar again, but it's something new. So those are things that you can do to kind of keep making your music interesting and keep, keep the listener, keep somebody engaged in going through your music and listening to the next thing and the next thing. Um, and it's not really about like trying to drop a breadcrumb trail and hoping they're going to keep picking it up and keep following along with your song. Really, if you don't start off with something that grabs their attention and moves them emotionally or, or mentally in some way, um, I think, I feel like you've kind of lost them out of the gate in the first place, right? But this is really, I've just been setting my music up like this because I just know that this works. Um, and it's not so much that, oh, this works, so I'm just going to do it. But I, um, I listen to the music that makes me want to move, and I listen to the music that I enjoy listening to. It's why do I keep listening to it? What makes me keep coming back to this? A lot of times it's because it moves me emotionally. There's something that I connect with. But there's also elements in that song that, like, um, I like something, but I don't want to hear it for the whole, whole song. It's like when you take it away, it makes me want to stick around because I'm like, oh, I want that back. And then they bring it back in the song. And you're like, there it is. I like that. You know, so you can do those little things with your music, too. If there's something that's really awesome about your song, it's okay to take it away for a second and then put it back in. You know, so it's, it's fine to just, like, um, I'll even do that with bass lines. Like, I started really, really making my bass lines more and more simple and more open. And I'll start with this really busy bass line, and then I'll just start to remove notes. And then I might, um, I might have the whole bass line in for, like, the hook, where it's just jamming and it's that whole thing. And then the verse, it's, like, another version of that bass line where there's less going on. Or it might have a breakdown where it's like even less of that is going on. So you can start to um, make these variations on something that's like a really cool idea in your song. Like even, even this vocal chop with, with Lauren, it becomes a melody line all in and of itself, but I could play around with that and start to mute out notes and see what other um, variations I can create on that. And so then I can start to, now I can give it back to you, but I can give it to you in a different way. And it starts to kind of keep it interesting. But the, I think the thing to keep in mind is if it's not interesting anymore, if it's not moving you, if, you don't, if you're not feeling it, you know what I mean? So like that's when it's kind of like, okay, that's a, that's a good idea, but maybe not for this particular case, you know? And so when you're working on your music, um, think about those kind of things and how you can take an idea that you had and um, maybe not necessarily improve upon it, but change it in a way. So like this idea where I had, I found a good vocal chop of her vocals, right? Uh, what I did was when we created this breakdown, I didn't have any of this stuff here. So I didn't have this vocal chops and it felt like it was missing something. So I went back to that original idea of the vocal chops, but when I tried to put in the original vocal chop, it just felt like I was bringing something back that was like, okay, I already heard this. You know, it's like, it's nothing really new. And so I felt like it still needed that, but maybe in a different way. So then I added in a different vocal chop and I even messed with the tempo. So what I was talking about earlier about how you can change tempos to make things more interesting. So I started off with these quarter notes and then I switched it to an eighth note. So it starts off kind of slow, and I'll solo this out so you can hear it. And then I take the same thing, and I double it. I double time it, basically. And it makes absolutely no sense, and there's actually no real melody line to it, so it's probably not the... Um, Probably not the best example, but the emotion I was going for here was this whole song is about breaking up. It's about, you know, we're split up now and I'm so lost and I'm confused. And so in this moment in the breakdown was like this, 
time of just confusion and this whole, like all the chops weren't really supposed to make sense. So in the context of the song, I think it works. Um, but yeah, you can play around with stuff like that, right? So I brought back this vocal chop idea, but I brought it back in a new way again. Does that make sense? So now instead of adding other layers, which the, the instrumental itself is different in this section, but I changed the vocal chops too. So now it sounds like this. And uh, there's this other little layer I forgot that I added in there too. And this is one of those subtle kind of things that you can do to kind of pick up the pace too. So it's just this little driving rhythmic thing in the background that maybe you don't notice it, but it's, it's starting to pick up the pace because you're hearing that So when you add that in with all the rest of the music. All right, and so the other thing is in here, this uh, reactor, this winner or not, these two sounds, they start to layer up. So I start with these two sounds, and then I build it and get bigger and heavier in the, uh, where is it, in the, in the hook. So all of this stuff right here, all these sounds that are going on in the hook, now I'm adding these extra layers to it. So it's not, it starts with these two kind of synth sounds here. Actually, sorry, it's just this one. I forgot the reactor's muted. So I just turned that to audio is what I did. Let me... Fill out my vocals and just solo this out. And where'd those synths go? Not shifters. Lead. I'm missing something in here. Oh, from print. Not that one. Maybe it was that. No, it wasn't that. But I'm just trying to find the uh, synths that I used in there. There we go. I forgot about them. Sorry, guys. So then um, harmonies. So in the synths, right, starting from the breakdown, what I did was I started to stack the synths out. And so they just get bigger and bigger and bigger as this goes through. So if I just play the synths in my, and just the synths. So you can hear that's just these two things going on. And then it gets bigger when I add in another layer here, halfway through the build. So I add this harps gritty right here. And so it starts to add another layer and it's gonna keep the listener engaged because it's adding some new elements to it before it really gets big and hits this big section. And in that section, that's where I drop in this lead synth. And that, coupled up with her vocals, uh, it gives you a lot kind of going on there. Because there's the melody from what she's singing with You Forgot About Us. You forgot about us, but you forgot about me. 
and it gives you another melodic sound that you could even hum along with and you could take away from this song. Da -na 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 -na. So when you're making your music, um, that's something to keep in mind too, is that the memorable side of your song, when you give somebody that uh, something that they can hum and take away with them. So like what I played originally with that vocal chop, you, somebody could hum that out to somebody else. So there's just one sound that's playing in a melodic pattern. When you start to do chords and all this crazy stuff, or if you do like these Hendrick-y kind of solos um, where you're going crazy and like doing all these runs and everything, um, people can't remember that and maybe not sing it to other people. So that's where the simplicity and the phrasing kind of comes in. So this lead synth that I have going on here, it just repeats twice throughout the hook. And it's something that people could remember and maybe hum to a friend. So it's like, that's something else that they can take away from this song. Uh, and it makes it a little bit more memorable. So then, so that's the synths. <clears throat> and <clears throat> all this talking. Um, so yeah, so that's how the, we added some more rhythmic pacing, I guess you could say, where we kind of sped things up when we double timed the chops and added in this other little sound. This is just another uh, vocal chop of her, of her voice where I'm just using one sound over and over and over. So that's all that's going on is this slice that's just playing, playing it rhythmically so that it adds another texture to it to build it up uh, in, before it goes into the hook. And then on these shifter sounds, I started to have some fun with this. And I took her voice and uh, I stretched it and did some fun stuff with it. So if I just solo out just that. So I know that doesn't sound like her voice, but it actually was her voice. Um, so if I go in here, uh, you can see right here this goodbye. And then I have saturation, simple delay, auto pan, multiband dynamics, glue compressor. I have a lot of stuff going on there. Um, and then I just made like a small loop of her voice right here. And then you'll see like when it plays back. And what I did was um, on this rate, I started to speed up the rate on her vocals there, or on the auto pan. And so it was just like going all over the place. And I had the loop going on. So this um, inside of here, uh, I was playing around with some of the different stuff inside of Simpler, where I can take this, um, this rate with this LFO, and I can start to have some fun with that as well. So you'll see here, this line is just me playing around with this LFO rate. So it starts off at this quarter note right here. So this is the LFO inside of Simpler. And it just starts off at a quarter note. And this frequency, uh, this filter is kind of opening up as it's getting faster. And then with the simple delays and auto pans, so those are the things that you can do to start to add movement, right? So we start with the quarter notes, and it slowly gets faster and builds into these 16th notes. And then we have the filter kind of opening up and the simple delays, adding all these other crazy echoes and stuff. And so it just takes this one sound and starts to make it a lot more interesting in the context of all these other ones. And so now it's not just the same riser sound that was going on before the hook and before um, this breakdown part, right? So where you see these other um, shifter sounds, it's now the same. It's now a shifter sound, but it's slightly different. So again, we're adding new information to the listener. So by the time they get here, they're not like, oh, "Okay, here comes that build again." You know, you're giving them something new. Now you're changing it slightly. So every step along the way for this whole journey, 
um, I'm giving you something new throughout the song. And I think that's what helps to kind of keep people engaged. Now, I'm not saying every song you ever make needs to be this involved and doesn't need to change up this much. Um, but you can start to take elements of this and things like this to add it into your music and start to keep the listener engaged. You can drop some stuff out so that way they're like, oh, where'd that go? And then bring some stuff back um, and then bring it back later because they want to hear that again. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different things you can take from this and apply to your music. You don't have to make this exactly, um, but hopefully you guys can take something from this and be able to apply it to your music um, in a way that will help you kind of keep people engaged with what it is that you're creating. Um, because again, people love familiarity. They love something that they already know. That's why popular music is so popular. And I know people hate <clears throat> like traditional wedding music and like, you know, traditional, like, like all the line dancing stuff. I've DJed lots of weddings and there's like couples who are like, I want absolutely no line dances. I don't want any of this music or that music. And I'm like, cool, that's, that's fine. I'm play that. I won't play that. That's no problem. But the reason that stuff is so popular is because people want something familiar and they want something they can sing along with. That's why karaoke does so well. You know, like people want to feel involved. They want to be a part of your music, right? And so if you're not creating something that gives them an opportunity to get involved with your music by singing along um, or being able to share it with their friends, right? If they can't say, oh my God, did you hear this? And, it, and they're like, no, what is that? And they're like, oh, it goes like this. You know, if they, if they don't feel compelled to share it, it's like your music's not going to go very far. And like the reason all those like line dancing things and those kind of songs that, that, you know, some people look down on, they, they do so well because people want to get involved. They want things that they can share memories with. They want things that they can share with other people. You know, when you were at that wedding and you guys did that line dance, people can talk about that memory. Like, oh, yeah, do you remember that one time we karaoke that one song and we totally messed up the whole thing, but we love that song? You know, people want those moments to be able to look back onto. And the way I look at my music is I want to create moments for people. You know, in my song, I want to create those moments for people, some moments that somebody can have and like, oh, my gosh, I love that moment, you know, and like create a moment for somebody. And that's something that you can do with your music as well. Um, so anyways, that's kind of a, a bit of a tangent. But hopefully you guys got something out of this with what you can um, do with your music. And like I said, there's kind of those main three things that all music really should have. And as long as you have at least two of those three things, you know, energy, motion, or emotion, uh, as long as you have at least two of those three, three things, then you're doing all right. Um, and you can, you can get all through, if you can get all three of those things in your song, um, then I'd say you're going to be doing pretty well with your music. So um, I'll open it up. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask. If there's anything that maybe I didn't cover that you would have liked to have seen, especially in this, for an example, um, just ask and let me know. Anything? Question? Yeah? Always be confident in music. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that confidence will take you a long way, for sure. But uh, the, uh, what I was telling these guys earlier is the, the sounds that you choose to put in your music can completely change the, the vibe and the feel of the, the song, right? And so uh, some of that confidence goes into choosing the sounds that you feel belong in this song, you know? So I would, I would just be, one, one thing that I've gotten in the habit of, uh, I'll share this with you. I learned this when I was working at Westlake. One of my buddies that worked there, uh, Rob Cohen, um, he's also an engineer, producer, and he would bounce out. He was always, he was telling me like, always bounce out your songs. It doesn't matter if you only created like an eight bar loop. He's like, turn it into like a 30 second bounce and just bounce it and have a, like a folder. Like I keep a Google Drive folder and put my bounces in that. And so I have it with me everywhere I go. I can listen to it at any time. And that actually creates more opportunity because I can play it for somebody 
but also it gave me more confidence in playing music for people too, because as I started to play things for people, they're like, oh, that's pretty good. And I might not have thought it was like the most amazing thing, but you'd be surprised sometimes. You might make something that you think is hot garbage, and then somebody listens to it, and you're like, they love it, you know? So I'd say always be confident with your music and always um, be open to sharing it because that's what's really going to start opening some doors for you, and it's going to maybe even open, uh, set off some light bulbs for you as well. It's definitely helped me out. Yeah, so sampling, um, anything in particular? Oh, okay. Yeah, so chopping samples, like a lot of times what I'll do, like I took her vocals here and I think normally what I'll do is I'll just take a section of her vocals and I'll chop it like on quarter notes or eighth notes or something. And I don't try to go in and be very specific with how I chop it uh, because what happens, what I've noticed is when I try to be like, I'm going to chop this note and this note, and I just want to play those two notes, and that's all I play with is those two notes. And when I just take a section of the song and I just chop it at quarter notes or eighth notes, it chops it in weird places sometimes. And so when I play that back on my pads, I'm like hearing things in a new way that I wouldn't have like just chosen those sounds. So when it comes to sampling, um, yeah, just taking a section, chunk it out, and just try to have, have the sampler or something slice it up in a, in a new way for you. Because sometimes that can lead you to playing with the sounds in a way that you wouldn't Otherwise, and I'm very much a drummer. I grew up with uh, playing concert band drums and marching band drums. And so I do well with the rhythmic. And so like chopping samples and playing them back in a rhythmic fashion works well for me. Um, but there's tons of other ways to do samples and sampling. You can stretch it and do all kinds of fun stuff with it. So when it comes to sampling, I would say find one thing that works that, okay, I can do this and this and this, and just do that a bunch of times until you've got that solid, and then try a new sampling technique. You know, just figure out one sampling technique that works good for you. So hopefully that helps. Is, hold on. Let me adjust the level on this. Um, any other questions about anything we went over? Yeah, no, I know that. The latency issue is mostly because if I take this any lower than 256, it's going to play back all funky. Um, but yeah, no, I know about the latency. <laughs> Not a fan of it, but making it work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, um, oh, oh, yeah, same, Lauren, she did the uh, little things. Yeah. I just had her in here last night. We were recording. Um, so yeah, this is a, a song that she did called Us. The original is on her SoundCloud. I should shout her out on here. Um, SoundCloud, she's got like three of them. <laughs> so if I go to SoundCloud, uh, I think I have it on mine. So my SoundCloud is SoundCloud DJ Simple. Just SoundCloud forward slash DJ Simple. And then hers, she posted that one, I think, on Lauren Grace. Yeah, her page, Lauren Grace. So you can check her out there. So she has her original up there, too. So this is, this is the song, the DJ Simple rework, Lauren Grace, Us. This one on here is all mastered and everything. So what you heard in Ableton right now isn't the mastered version. I, like, mastered it separate from this session, even though I had... I had like virtual tape machine on the master, but that was it. Um, I mastered it completely separate, but um, mixed it inside of Ableton. And then the original is somewhere further down on here, I think. But you can hear the original and hear what she did with that. Um, and then you can listen to that version too. 
and then all of her other music too. I did master on Pro Tools. I used a, a lot of UAD plugins. Yeah. But I have, I have my own mastering stuff here too. Like I like, I got Isotope, Ozone. I like that. And Slate, FTX. I use those quite a bit. Use them for like a rough master sometimes. I'll just toss them on the mastering chain. Um, that just, if I'm in a hurry, like I said, when you're trying to um, create music and you just, you know, want to wrap it up and have something bounced out just to reference, just have like a rough mastering chain and just put it through it. You know, I do that quite a bit. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, Andrew. Oh, yeah. So there's Andrew Wang. Um, and then the science behind catchy song articles. So there's this other page. So this was pretty useful. There's some links to some other, other um, articles and stuff inside of here. Some of the things that they were referencing in this particular article. And then the, uh, the other one is this book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. It's just a good book in general, I recommend. Uh, but there's lots, of, there's lots of books that I've been reading about, like, the science of the human brain and how all that stuff works. And it's really interesting how we operate. Um, but, yeah, like, the, that, the, that book, uh, The Power of Habit, definitely recommend that. It's chapter, I want to say chapter 8, I think, where he talks about specifically the hey ya, um, that example. But, yeah, he talks about that and goes more in depth on what I was mentioning about um, how our brains work. Uh, any other questions? No? All right, because if not, I'm going to wrap things up so I can get ready to go teach class. <laughs> um, I think that's pretty much it as far as whenever. I didn't really go over the drums and the percussion. There wasn't much to go over on this. Um, one of the things, oh, remember I mentioned tempo? Uh, and how you can use rhythmic patterns to change the tempo. So like uh, in the hook, when the drums come in, if I take out these hi-hats, these hi-hats, I change, uh, I'll show you what I did there. So I'll play this without the hi-hats. Uh, oops, I got something soloed. All right, so same thing with the hi-hats. Sounds different, right? I don't know, at least to me it does. Because without them, it sounds very straight. It's a doom, ba, doom, do, doom, ba. And the hi-hats, I played them at a triplet. And what that means is for every quarter note, there's three hi-hat hits. So for every downbeat, there will be three hi-hat notes. Um, and that actually, like, if you use triplets, um, it can start to create a, a sort of a groove in the track instead of this, like, just playing hi-hats on the eighth or the quarter note. So if you're not familiar with what that is, it would be like if I just took and deleted those and played just the quarter notes. So you'll hear it with just the quarter notes and it's gonna sound different. Right, so then there's that, or if I did eighth notes, uh, that'd be the eighth note, I think that's right. Let's just copy that. So that eighth note pattern feels way different than the triplet pattern. And you can use that to your advantage to make things sound like they're swung out or just to give it a different feel, right? And to make, the, make it feel like um, things are changing. So that's something else you can use. Once you understand rhythms and rhythmic patterns and things like that. You can use those in your music to start making it um, sound like it's changing when it's really not. 
you know? So that's uh, one, another example I wanted to show you guys that I forgot about. So yeah, anyways, I want to thank you guys for coming to check this out. The next one that I want to do is how to finish your music. So if you guys are interested in that, then stay tuned in. Um, here, I'll hit you guys up on uh, Canvas and let you guys know here at the school. And then if you're watching this online, then uh, you can check me out at jrnoble.co and I will post up more about what I'm doing there. All right. So thanks, guys, again.